The views and opinions of this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers. There is substantial risk of loss in trading futures and options, which you should carefully consider prior to trading. Well, we saw soybeans got back a little bit of Tuesday's losses. Cord was quiet, wheat under pressure, crude oil down over 2% as well on the day Wednesday. So we got a few different things of note to talk about and what was otherwise a somewhat quiet market day. We're going to go through things, though, and get some perspective. Joining us now, Mike Zuzalo with Global Commodity Analytics here for our market analysis. Mike, thanks for being with us, as always. I'm going to start with energy. Crude oil seemed like it was the biggest loser on Wednesday, and I was I was, and I wasn't surprised, I guess, with the action in crude oil. I know we got to the DOE numbers out Wednesday were a bit more than expected, Yet all the tension in the Middle East has me, you know, worried about what crude could do if Israel retaliates against Iran. So I guess let, let's start with what's going on in crude, Mike. What are your thoughts uh, with Wednesday's action? Yeah, I think that's a really good place to start, Jesse, because, you know, we've talked a lot about in the last several months, the idea that the crude oil and the wheat market are very closely aligned with one another from a standpoint of how the funds think about this market. And that if we want a market rally by the funds and, and the, the cause to get the funds who are very net short the grains out of a net short position, I've always had the mindset that it's got to be a wheat led and, and therefore energy currency led market. And today is a, a kind of a clinic on that mindset. And, and coupled with what you said, it, exactly right, WTI and R. Bob crude, uh, WTI crude and RBOB unleaded gas were the leaders to the downside, along with European natural gas and wheat. Those were the top four to the downside percentage losers on today's trade. And what that says to me is, is that the market went into a risk off mindset in the midst, as you say, of a very hot geopolitical situation in the Middle East where crude oil and wheat were bought with both hands last Friday. So they bought the rumor on Friday, sold the fact on Monday, and then we got fresh IMF data and fresh Chinese GDP data Monday, Tuesday. Mm -hmm. China saying they grew over 5%. IMF saying they're improving world growth versus their uh, update from about two months ago. And so we're seeing these markets give way. What is causing this? And it's going to be a flimsy reason. I, I acknowledge that, but I really think that the reason we went risk off on the middle part of the trading day today was because the Biden administration initiated a, a triple um, a point to where they're going to go ahead and uh, put more tariffs on steel with China. And what mm -hmm. I mean by is they're currently at 7%. They're saying they're going to go up to 21%. And I think with the interest rates already high and the Fed now walking back the idea that they're going to cut rates, then this US-China trade friction being ratcheted up, I really think it took a hit in the commodity markets and the funds doubled down on their positioning. And it, it, the reason I'm stammering so much today is because we're really in a vulnerable spot now with these funds, unfortunately. Well, and thinking about crude as well, pulled up a monthly uh, WTI chart on our video feed that you sent me, first of many charts we got to look at here today, and, and kind of echoing some of those sentiments. I mean, as we look at crude overall, what stands out to you on, on the monthly crude chart right now? The biggest thing that stands out to me is the trend line that we are now beating up against with new monthly lows today. That's a trend line that's been tested three times now, and it's been tested going all the way back to February of this year. And that is a trend line we don't want to take out right below the current lows from today. And I think this will match up a lot with some of the trend lines that we'll see in some other charts that we look at today. The other thing that I would add to you, this is the idea that as I project in this chart, if we have a wider regional war, I think the crude oil market can go above my overvalue 9151 area, 9150 area, and head up towards the 115 area. I'm going to stand by that. And so because of that, and because of the increasing likelihood that this Middle East will get worse before it gets better, 
I'm going to suggest to you again, like I have the past few months, that it's really the crude oil and the wheat that need to lead this market higher. And if they break down technically, I think we've got to get some paper positions in place to cover us to the downside. Let's look at the Bloomberg Commodity Index. We have a couple charts on that, a couple different correlations that you shared with me there. And we look at this quite often. Any notes here as we think about this crude wheat lead market? Any notes that stand out to you in terms of the Bloomberg Commodity Index? I'll pull up this chart first. Yeah, blue line is the Bloomberg Commodity Index. The purple line is the MSCI Emerging Market ETF. And, and that tends to run very closely in sync with the Bloomberg Commodity Index. And this makes sense because a weaker dollar takes pressure off emerging markets. Emerging markets can buy more and import more commodities and they have a healthier economy. What we have right now is almost the exact opposite because of these inflation numbers coming through and some of the other economic data that's coming through that the Federal Reserve is not going to start cutting rates that projected the bond yields back up to fresh 2024 highs in the two and the five and 10 year yields earlier this week. And that then created an environment where the trade got sour on emerging markets because of the strong dollar following those bond yields higher. We've talked about this a lot. This chart shows you though, when you go back to 2010, 2011, look how much in sync these markets typically are. If you want a major high in that Bloomberg commodity index, you typically got to have the emerging markets running full tilt. So having said that, today as we went on the air, the dollar started to turn lower because the trade in its risk off mindset, in my opinion, started to buy U.S. Treasuries. And when you buy Treasuries, you automatically push the Treasury yield down. And then that takes the, the, the shine off of the U.S. dollar. So the story is not completely written yet. But I think coupled with that WTI chart that we just looked at, we're really in a situation where we need to see the dollar peak to help offset some of this negative risk off mindset that these trade frictions and this inflation and these high interest rates are creating in the world economy. And I mean, like right now. So mm -hmm. I really want the listener and the viewer to really understand that. Well, another Bloomberg chart. This is the more traditional Bloomberg commodity chart that you and I look at. Uh, any any ties in with that uh, last chart we looked at compared to emerging markets here, Mike? It really has a lot of uh, uh, sympathetic movement and positive relationship with the Bloomberg commodity index. This is the grain sub index of that commodity index. But I think more importantly, Jesse, is the support line that we're on again or getting close to testing again. It looks almost identical to the crude oil support line in terms of importance in the opening up of the downside. And if I were to show you a hard red wheat monthly chart right now, it would look a lot like this Bloomberg Grain Commodity Index monthly chart. And this is where the rubber hits the road. Crop conditions this week went down in Kansas and Oklahoma. We're now five points below good to excellent levels that we were at at the 1st of April, uh, Col excuse me, Colorado and, and Kansas. Oklahoma is down about 13 points from the 1st of April, good to excellent conditions. We have enough weather underneath us and enough fundamental supply demand uh, issues from the WASDE report last week. We should be leading the market higher. The geopolitical tensions, the Black Sea issues, the port, the Chernomorsk port is still shut down by Ukraine because of the heavier fighting that's going on right around Odessa. And so you've got fundamentals that don't match up with what's happening in these charts. In, unless you take a step back and look at it from a fund led perspective and the fundamentals they look at. And this is that fund versus fundamental mindset. So what I'm getting at, bottom lining it out. If we take out that crude oil support and we take out this support on the Bloomberg Grain Commodity Index, my clients and subscribers are going to get a text blast immediately to recommend getting puts bought in corn and in beans and, and really pushing hard on the soybeans uh, because it's still profitable in the new crop and in and what little old crop I have left. But I've already got the puts picked out at this stage of the game. We are joined today by Mike Zuzalo from Global Commodity Analytics here on Market Talk. And uh, great points, and I want to echo some of that sentiment more here in the grains. Let's pull up our 
uh, HRW July historical charts on the video feed to kind of continue that thought of this wheat led market, whether it's up or down. And uh, KC wheat, Chicago wheat under the pressure. We alluded to that earlier uh, on the day Wednesday. What are some things you're seeing right now on this HRW chart, Mike? Yeah, this is kind of the final say in everything that we've talked about. And I won't belabor the point, but this is the 2024 July HRW. Um, the purple is 2009, the yellow is 2015. Look how similar going into the beginning of April we were to 2009 and 2015. And it was in right around April 24th, 25th that these two markets really diverged. And the 2009 market went up, made major highs by the time we got to uh, the Memorial Day time period. Um, and then the 2015 market did the exact opposite, started, you know, went down and made major lows by the time we got to the 1st of May. This is the chart that I'm going to be watching very, very closely. And I'm hoping we're, we're similar in fundamentals uh, and price action as 2009 and the hard red week just flat out takes care of business and head starts to head higher and puts a lot of this negativity that we're talking about today behind us. But if we do fall off the cliff like we did in 2015, you've lost your main leader there and you've lost your crude oil leader by most likelihoods. And this is why this is the chart that I put up for the for the analyst like me and the producer client like I deal with. It says, well, how much lower could it go? We're already in the tank. Well, this goes back to you don't know how much lower it could go with the way the funds operate right now. And so what we did in 2015 is we took this price essentially from a 570 level all the way down to 490. And the hard red wheat chart actually shows about a 60 or 70 cent move down if we lose the support lines that we're talking about. I want to throw this at you as well as we kind of wrap up our grain discussion. Just on the soy side, corn to me, corn was kind of a dud. It's a follower right now. Not much market movement this week in the corn side. Beans, though, you know, we had a down day Tuesday. Wednesday largely kind of felt like a dead cat bounce to me in a way, Mike. To your points uh, here today with uh, watching crude and wheat, I feel like the soy complex itself has got maybe a, a little more to lose here if, if something breaks to the downside, Mike. Yeah, it's got the meal market underneath it right now, and it looks very healthy in the meal on a weekly basis on the charts. And, and I think that really speaks well of the meal, especially given the poultry still getting HPAI in states like uh, Michigan, which was reported again, I think, last night for another flock. Um, but I, I think you're 100 percent right. Can beans really do it alone with a reduced export number from USDA last week? Can they really do it alone on a 340 million bushel carry in now? And can they really do it alone with USDA looking a lot more right than wrong with some of the private estimates coming out recently, coming close to the Brazil soybean estimate that USDA just gave us? And I think this is where Argentina remains and this is where the meal comes back into play, I think, Jesse. Why would meal be rallying and looking so good? I really think it has to do with Argentina. I think it has to do with the leaf hopper issue. And if that's the case, then the corn can only be tighter in terms of supply in South America. So. As I said to another person I talked to today uh, on the media, I see corn as having the best suit of cards. The only problem with the corn is it's attached to the weed at the hip. And I think that's really the bottom line. But that's why I'm doing paper positions in corn, especially uh, because I really don't want to throw in the towel on the cash side because I really think we're tightening up on both the domestic and the world supply levels at this point. Definitely want to remind folks, of course, that risk of trading futures and options can be substantial, but... Uh, a lot of things that we have to take note of here in those grain markets. Let's go to livestock here, Mike, and I'll pull up a correlation chart with the S&P 500 and cattle. Pretty quiet day Wednesday after we, we found some good strength in cattle early in the week. So uh, what are some things you're seeing here, correlations uh, standing out to you in this cattle market right now? Yeah, I think the latest news headlines have given us a chance in the live cattle, especially to find new weekly highs. And we've been able to build a base and, and we tested some downside on Wednesday. We were able to recover, though, pretty nicely. Feeders are also supporting from a standpoint of the corn market, weakening with the with the uh, wheat market. And I think lastly, Jesse, the Chinese came out with updated pork production numbers. I want to say their Q1 production was the lowest in three or so more years 
in terms of actual production uh, of, of pork. And so it's a very welcome situation. There's less competition, less likelihood that the Chinese will uh, come in and, and, uh, and, and sell in, out of their reserves and, and, and cheapen up their pork prices. Uh, in order to keep their their uh, economy going, um, the problem. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was no, I was just I was echoing what you said. No, sorry. Uh, continue on there, Mike. Yeah, the the problem that we have now is the stock market, and and we'll t take a look at a couple charts here. But I want to show the correlation between the S and P 500 and the live cattle on an 18 week basis. We've looked at this a couple times already in the past, but it's still roughly plus 80%. So there's a very high relationship and, and price relationship, especially between cattle futures and the S&P 500 futures. And I think we need to keep that in mind, especially in this environment where the dollar has just gotten done making fresh 2024 highs against a lot of major currencies. Look at the Japanese yen. We're literally at the highest level in dollar since 1990. What's that going to do for our beef export pace? So that's a real critical feature to this market. Yeah, let's uh, another S&P 500 monthly chart here as we shift away from the cattle correlation, just kind of continuing that sentiment. I, I've largely felt that these livestock markets outside of the news cycle have been very tied at the hip here with the financial markets as of late, Mike. They really are because the consumption patterns are very similar. When you get good consumption and inflation data, it's usually related to the food and the restaurant eating. But we've also started to see some weakening and some some issues underneath the current, so to speak, or underneath the surface. And what's important about this relationship between cattle and the S&P is that now we've taken out the March lows in the, uh, the S&P 500, which also takes you below the February highs. And so you've taken out a trend line, you've taken out the previous month's lows, and you've taken out the previous high set back in February. So you're really opening yourself up to more downside. And if I looked at this chart and didn't know anything about any market whatsoever, I'd be looking at that 2022 high uh, up there around 4,800, wondering why aren't we going back and testing that high now that we've lost all these technical support features. So we've got to keep that in mind with the cattle. And the reason I bring this up so much, Jesse, is because the profitability in the cattle market right now is so upside down. We are bleeding red at this point, and it, and it goes back to the futures curve. And that's what we're looking at here is a live cattle futures curve. Uh, you're looking at from April all the way to August of 2025. And you notice that the prices go down into August and then they start to build. And I, I pinpointed December, and that's because I've been talking to clients that have been buying six weight feeders. Uh, Yankton, South Dakota actually had a sale today. Six, six fifties went for 309, 694 steers went for 296. You look at this forward curve in the December futures price at 180, you're taking a bath for about 12 to 13 bucks a hundred weight um, when it comes to where your break evens are. Your break evens are really at 192, 193 based upon the model I use and the, and the calculator I use uh, to market those six weight feeders in the month of December. Um, we've really got to be careful here. If the feeder cattle and the fats start to open up to the downside because of the S&P 500, again, I think floors underneath you is, is really, really an important thing to consider. Mike, great stuff as always. Let's wrap up our conversation and, and reiterate to folks here again, just a, a lot going on, a lot that we have to keep our, our fingers on or eyes on you know you know keep the pulse on things here even with a busy planting season in front of us etc so what would you reiterate to folks here as we watch the markets mid-april i'm still looking for a better second half of april for corn and beans to get hedges in place jesse as long as the wheat and the crude oil don't tell me i'm wrong and if they do i'm going to take it at face value fantastic well the folks want to reach out to you as well with questions they want to look at your analysis and more I know they could find you online very easily. Where can they reach you, Mike? Yeah, globalcomresearch.com, globalcom with two Ms, research.com, important but place to go for product services and also a free trial. But as you said, there's a lot of risk in commodities and we see it on a daily basis nowadays. Globalcomresearch.com is where you can get your questions answered by Mike Zuzalo with Global Commodity Analytics. Mike, always enjoy the conversation. Thanks for joining us. Have a great week. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks, Jesse. You too.
That's going to do it for Market Talk. Find us at markettalkag.com. I'm Jesse Allen. Have a great afternoon. Make sure to subscribe to the Market Talk YouTube channel. You can watch our latest interviews with top market analysts in the country, find bonus content, and much more. It's easy. Just go to youtube.com slash at markettalkag and hit the subscribe button. Or you can search for Market Talk Egg on YouTube.